Thanks, thanks, James, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I will be sharing um, kind of a more conceptual perspective. And in, indeed, I'm, I'm a research leader at Rentura, but I'm really uh, speaking here in, in personal capacity today. So I'll start with contextualizing the importance of reward and recognition in, in the context of research culture. The word uh, has been mentioned a few times already. I'll then go on to kind of look within this context, what it is actually that needs changing um, in terms of improving the reward system. And I'll kind of finalize with thinking about some of the contributions that are already being made to, to, to this, making these changes, specifically also zooming in a bit about in uh, kind of the perspective of what individual researchers can do to contribute, because I think that is maybe a group that is uh, not always specified what they can do to, um, to progress, um, kind of improving how we reward and recognize. So starting from that contextual perspective, so my own background and interest in reward and recognition has been in part related to work I've done uh, a few years ago now for the Royal Society who, um, who were leading a program of work on research culture. And um, where the term has been mentioned a few times already, I think it's always good to remind everyone in the audience uh, what we mean with that. And within the Royal Society's program, research culture was defined as encompassing the behaviors, values, expectations, attitudes, and norms of our research communities. And so that influence and determines the way in which research is conducted as well as communicated. Um, in kind of extension of that uh, definition, I also like to kind of pull in um, another important program on research culture by uh, Wellcome, so a big, uh, big um, funder of uh, health and medical science in the UK and, and, and beyond. And so Wellcome did a really big program following that by the Royal Society, where they were really asking researchers in a big survey how they think about the culture they work in, what their perspectives are on that culture. And within this program, research culture was very simply defined as how research is done as opposed to what research is done. I'm pulling up this definition as well because I'll refer to it uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, I think it, it does reflect uh, the, same, the same kind of content as the um, Royal Society's definition, but it's, it's kind of maybe a bit more um, elegant and simplistic in terms of using it um, in what follows. So before I kind of link the importance of reward and recognition in the context of research culture, I think it's, it's important to remind ourselves why we are talking about this topic. What are we trying to improve when we talk about um, a better research culture? And so again, I'm pulling from these two big programs uh, that I think have really put this topic on the agenda, especially uh, in the UK. So within the Royal Society's work, one of the reports uh, mentions that the aim here is to counter negative consequences of poor research culture, including over-reliance on metrics, compromises on rigor and integrity, undervaluing of negative results of, and of replication studies, a lack of transparency around hiring and promotions, barriers to diversity and inclusion, um, to name a few. The Welcome program has, I think, just also the way it's been structured, been focusing very strongly on impact, specifically on researchers of poor research culture and specific ones that they have referred to throughout their work are unhealthy competition, bullying and harassment, poor management practice, stress and anxiety, mental health issues, impacts on personal relationships and isolation and loneliness. Both of these programs do refer that the reason to counter these negative consequences is to improve research environments and ultimately to improve research quality. And I think that is really the bottom line here uh, in terms of the aim of um, these discussions and the progress that is being made. So how does reward and recognition relate to research culture? So for this, I'm going back actually to one of the core conclusions um, sorry, I'm not managing to go to the next slide. Ah, there we are. So to kind of to um, think about how reward and recognition 
link to research culture, I really like to kind of go back to some of the core uh, findings and the key conclusions of the program um, that I worked on uh, for the Royal Society. And within that program, after lots of discussions and lots of different elements um, of the program, one of the kind of conclusions that came out was that um, there are actually core causes that are underlying a lot of those negative um, negative consequences of, of uh, poor research culture that I just discussed. And these were summarized as a highly competitive environment in combination with very, very narrow definitions of success. To some extent, this notion of narrow definitions of success is also reflected in some of the communication around the Welcome Program. And I'm referring here to um, a quote uh, by Jeremy Farrar in one of the pieces as part of the Welcome Program, who uh, stated that the relentless drive for research excellence has created a culture in modern science that cares exclusively about what is achieved and not about how it is achieved. So again, there is this exclusiveness, narrowness around what is being recognized um, in terms of also success and career progression. So the big conclusion here, um, of, of, of especially of the Royal Society's work, is that broadening definitions of su success as a countermeasure to the narrowness of current definitions has emerged as a central lever in creating more inclusive and more responsible research environments, and hence in improving research culture. And before kind of thinking a bit more about what we mean with broadening definitions of success and what kind of improvements we're thinking about, I think it's good to just take a minute to reflect on what this means. Um, because I think it's, it's, quite, it's quite a daunting conclusion. Uh, that reward and recognition seems to sit at the center of a lot of core issues that have been persistent in academia and that addressing reward and recognition is really a, a kind of powerful tool to address many of these issues holistically rather than focusing in on each of them individually. The flip side of that, of course, is that if we make changes to the systems that we use for reward and recognition, there is also um, the option to make changes or to impact on a lot of these other areas. And I think this is something really that everyone who makes changes to these systems should be aware of, that we need to measure the impact of what we're doing while making changes. And we need to really be aware of potential unintended consequences and, and avoid any such negative consequences on other areas that we could be affecting. So what do we mean with broadening definitions of success? And I said in the beginning, I would be kind of giving a bit of a conceptual perspective. And so I like to, when we think about broadening definitions of success in the academic con context, refer back to this performance matrix that uh, was actually used to, to kind of judge the performance of employees for one of the companies that I have worked uh, for throughout my career. And so um, I think this is a really interesting tool to look at when we are discussing um, the definitions of success and uh, evaluation of researchers. And so in the company I worked for, performance of uh, the people that worked there was uh, looked at in two dimensions. The first dimension on the y-axis looks at performance against tasks. So this is really the what. What is the employee doing? And is, is that in accordance with the tasks they are supposed to be um, performing? The other um, dimension on the x-axis is performance against a competency or behavior, the how. And uh, so it's clear in, in terms of reaching high performance that um, people working for this company would be expected to score well on both axes. So it wouldn't be possible to achieve a promotion or a bonus if um, you would be lacking on one of these axes. And so I want to bring back um, having kind of set this framework as a model to look at how we define success and good performance against the statement that I mentioned earlier by Jeremy Farrar, who said that modern science culture cares exclusively about what is achieved and not about how it is achieved. This would actually imply almost literally that 
In a lot of cases in academia, we're almost exclusively looking at the y-axis here. And excellence would actually sit at the top of that one axis rather than in the corner and as a culmination of the what and the how. So the kind of conceptual perspective that I want to bring here is that the broadening definitions of success, in my opinion, means really thinking about how we can bring in that responsible axis, that how axis, into the different ways in which we reward and recognize um, success within um, academia. Um, so how, how do we go about that? So this is a difficult, this is not an easy question. And I'm just in what follows, uh, I will talk about a few contributions that are um, a starting point for looking at um, how, we, how we kind of include the responsible axis. And before looking at a few examples, um, I want to maybe add that the kind of things that would be included are kind of behavioral aspects of both what we do, how we do science. So things like, um, aspects of research integrity, open science, openness, transparency, but also very much how we behave towards each other um, in research environments. The first example of how we can make more space for contributions on that responsible axis that I want to mention is uh, one project that I worked on, um, again, during my time working on the Royal Society's program, which is the resume for researchers. And so the whole idea be behind this kind of tool was to make more space for more varied contributions, including these contributions um, on, the, on the responsible axis. And so the idea would be that people can actually talk about contributions they make to four broad categories. The first one being a contribution to the generation of knowledge. Uh, and this could still, of course, include um, comments around uh, publications people have contributed to. Um, but it would then follow by contributions to the development of colleagues. And this could be both development of um, junior colleagues, including teaching and supervision. It could also include, of course, contributions to supporting more senior colleagues or contributions to team science. A third category is the contribution to the research community, which could include things such as peer review, organizing conferences, for example, but also uh, transparency and openness of sharing data, for example. And then finally, the contribution to society could uh, include things like public and policy engagement, could also include outreach, but um, also, of course, involving societal stakeholders more in the research program. I'm thinking, for example, about how patients are involved in research pro projects. There are, um, this is actually a model that is currently being tested uh, by Thunder, so UK um, UKRI, as well as the uh, Science Foundation in Ireland are looking at um, how they can start to maybe implement a version of this tool. Um, there are caveats to mention with, with trying to kind of start to use this, this tool. Um, and I think it's, it's good to just mention a few before I look at a few other things that funders are doing in this space in terms of contributing to this discussion. So a first caveat is that we really need to contextualize how we want to use this tool. And um, we have really envisioned that this would be used against either very specific criteria for a grant application or very specific, um, a very specific description for a job role so that it is clear for people filling out the tool which type of contributions are actually relevant against that specific description. A second caveat is that this might look very different from the kind of CV templates that researchers are used to. So researchers as well as evaluators will need quite a lot of support and guidance to start using templates like these. And then finally, um, I think it's important to expect that there will be resistance to these type of um, formats. First of all, because they really deviate from the status quo. Some evaluators will find it cumbersome to learn to use new models. But also, and this is maybe more important in terms of a consideration, there will be a generation of researchers um, who are kind of in a transition period where we are trying to kind of pilot new models who have been 
working towards a certain set of expectations and are now confronted with a change in the rules around what is expected of them. And that can be very challenging and we'll really need to think about how we support that generation of researchers um, if we want to go ahead with implementing these new tools. So I think this is the first example also that illustrates how funders are trying to start to respond to the discussions around um, the, the kind of reward and recognition discussion and including uh, this kind of more responsible behavior in recognition templates or, or evaluation templates. There's, there's other funders, especially in Europe, that are really joining this conversation and doing efforts to evaluate whether reward and recognition tools are fit for purpose. So Science Europe, um, who kind of is an umbrella organization for funders, has done quite a, a big piece of work, which I think has raised awareness for a lot of funders. There's also been other funders looking at these new kind of CV formats. For example, the, the Swiss National Science Foundation has also started to look at a narrative CV. And in the Netherlands, uh, there, there's been a lot of efforts actually in the last few years, um, a lot of which is based on a concept note called Room for Everyone's Talent. It's very interesting. I, I really like the model um, that they propose in this in this concept note, and I know they're building on it, and they're they're already testing also new new types of CV formats. Um, so, interestingly, they also came up with kind of four categories of contribution: education, research, impact, and leadership. They also have a lot of focus on things like open science, things like team science, so also looking more at this responsible axis. And what I really like about this one is that they have already built into their model that we should not expect researchers to start to just tick more boxes. It should be, be really about making sure that researchers can diversify their careers and spend certain times of their, spend more time in certain moments in their career on some of these categories than others. So I think that's something they've really captured nicely already within their model. Um, there's a lot of other players in the research system that are contributing. I'm not going to cover all of them, but I think it's important to mention that institutions are really thinking more about um, academic assessment. And DORA, together with the European Universities Association and Spark, have done a brilliant job at capturing some of the examples of where progress is being made uh, in this, in this uh, dashboard on DORA's website. They also have understood that um, universities are in, 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 in kind of different points of that journey. And I think they only recently um, came up with this brilliant tool uh, space, uh, a rubric for institutions to kind of analyze their progress um, in this space. So I think there's really um, a lot of progress. And I think Dora has been taking a, a really good role in leading this uh, in the university sector as well. Um, and then finally, as I kind of said, I will conclude with also some, some thoughts on how individual researchers can contribute. Um, I'll just quickly touch on what I think are a few important ways in which people can contribute. Um, these kind of thoughts are captured in more detail in um, a recent publication and the, the link is at the bottom of the slide if people want to kind of read in more detail. But so the, I think the first thing to do uh, for researchers is to kind of be vocal and join the conversation. And the people in this, um, in this discussion today are already doing that. So I think that's already a tick for that first step. A second point is that it's really um, important for researchers to keep sharing their insights and opinions. The impact of the work by the Royal Society and Welcome was really um, building on a lot of inputs from thousands of researchers and wouldn't have been, um, I think, that successful in really putting this topic on the political agenda, was it not for all the input these programs received? A third one is something small we can do every day. I think we can all make small changes in how we behave, very incremental, uh, one, one day at a time. Uh, a typical example here is the way we interact with each other. For example, uh, when, when a colleague shares with us the news that they have, they have published a new article, too often I think that the first response of a fellow researcher is still, in which journal did you publish? I think if we could change that question to either what was the research about or did you publish open access, that would make a huge difference in terms of the expectations we set for each other. 
Um, there's also, for those who are really keen to be more involved, um, opportunities to be become ambassadors for change. There's often calls for early career researchers to be involved, uh, for funders, for publishers in discussions. One example is the ambassador program of eLife, where one of the topics that is being discussed by early career researchers is uh, reward and recognition. And then finally, a lot of the researchers who are now earlier in their career will go, go on to, at some point uh, throughout their journey, be involved in assessment of researchers. And I hope that at least all those on the call will, at that point, remember to consider growth criteria, will remember to consider that responsible access, and will challenge the status quo and will challenge uh, where they feel that the, the success uh, or the, the kind of criteria that are used for an evaluation are too narrow. And I'll um, and there, so that we have ample discussion, uh, ample time for uh, questions and discussion. Thank you. Let's see whether I can stop sharing. Brilliant. There we go. Karen, thank you very much. That's fascinating. I, I think it's the idea of focusing on what we're doing, and I, I think just changing the focus like that could be really challenging to do, but really worthwhile. And I like the fact that. Having to piece everyone's slides today, and yours no exception, that we're talking about quite big concepts, changing culture. But I love the fact that every, all the speakers and yours, is, for example, that have not practical suggestions that things we can all do. Because I think it's quite natural for researchers and administrators, and even sometimes leaders of institutions, to feel sort of powerless to change these sort of tides of incentives that wash over us all. Okay, with a lot of interesting questions in the chat already. Uh, so let's have a look. Okay, anonymous attendee says a very interesting presentation. I completely understand the shift the focus from what to how. But what do you think about the challenges where a lot of researchers are chasing limited research grant opportunities, particularly when departments need to be partially self-funded? What are your sort of thoughts on the financial implications there? Yeah, um, so I think first of all, it's not it's not completely shifting from the what to the how, it's reaching a combination of those factors. So I think it needs to be a combination of the what and the how. So that's maybe the first thing to say in response. Um, in terms of um, the financial independence, um, you know, I think if we start to change this conversation, there needs to be consensus across uh, across kind of systems where we reward and recognize that this is the way forward. So that would mean that um, for that funders as well as institutions would go in the same direction. Uh, and I think if, if that's a consensus that would already alleviate some of the issues which we would have if there are different rules for getting funding from, from different places. Um, does that answer it, James? That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, another, another anonymous attendee says they really like the contribution models you're talking about. And as you say, it could take a while to get people used to being more reflective and use more broader and qualitative rather than quantitative measures when considering contributions, especially in recruitment. With recruitment panels being quite busy, how do you think we can foster acceptance of those practices in the recruitment process? I mean, the first thing I usually say here is maybe look at other, other sectors, because um, having moved from academia to other sectors, I have seen the difference in recruitment practices. And, you know, in most other sectors, there is really a habit to look at, OK, what will be required of this person in the job role? And if management is, a, is an important quality, then there will be competencies in the job descriptions and questions in the interview around management capacity. If open science is an important aspect, then there will be questions about it. I think we need to really think about in recruitment when we hire people, what is it, what is it we will value about what they will do here and, and align the job description as well as the recruitment process with what that is. And I do think that that will include, if we really do that thinking exercise as an institution, I do think that will include more on the how axis than it currently does. So, you know, my first answer here would be maybe learn from how this is done in other sectors, because in other sectors, this is really how recruitment works. 
And I think um, we can we can learn we can learn from that. We can keep some of those unique aspects, obviously, because I think academia has unique aspects that we need to preserve. But yeah. we, I think there is a mix to be found where we sit back and think and also look at how it's done elsewhere. Thank you. Sticking with the focus on career progression, once people have, are in an organisation, uh, Richie Hetherington says, uh, how do you change the, 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 the sort of reward ladder and, and progression ladder once you're in? How do we get those with established careers, he asked, to recognise the shift and not advise junior, junior colleagues that the same markers that led to the success of existing senior people still apply? That's, I mean, I think that is a, a very important point and not an easy one to answer. There are some people who say we will need a generational change to accomplish that. I think there are things we can do uh, before, before that generation change. And I think the first thing is um, a lot of, I mean, there are ex actually examples of where this is being done. I'm thinking of the, the UMC in, in Utrecht, where it was the leadership that actually decided we're going to, to uh, look at promotion differently and we're going to change the criteria for promotion where um, we look, for example, at things like stakeholder involvement much more. So I think there are, again, examples where this is being done um, successfully, not without resistance and not without difficulty, but where, you know, eventually a model was reached where those criteria have been changed. So I think, um, first of all, it's good to realize that it won't be easy. Uh, second, maybe go have a look at some of those DORA examples, because this for one, I think, is, is, is one that's mentioned in that portfolio uh, that DORA has compiled. And um, yeah, I think it will be up to leadership for universities to really support uh, if we want to achieve the change also at that senior level. And I think it will be important uh, to also then support the change for following generations. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, two related questions. Sarah Taylor says that funders tend to be from more kind of science background and discussion on reproducibility and negative results tend to be more appropriate to the sciences rather than social sciences or the arts. And are you aware of any work done by social science and art to make this more relevant? And uh, Karen Sayer says, again, as a research leader in arts and humanities, how do I champion this stuff to be in those fields? So I think it is true that there is uh, there's there's maybe more work being done uh, from certain disciplines around this. Um, I mean, I think the the first thing to say is if if there is a feeling of having a gap in certain disciplines, I think it's up to the people who feel there is an interest to start these discussions there to see you know maybe what they can do, um, what what lives in in those um, in those groups. And to to really see how how we can kind of join up also with others. Um, again, um, there's I think the the work, for example, um, by Dora kind of points to a lot of, of different examples. I haven't really gone through all of them, but it would surprise me if there's nothing of relevance in there. So I think there are already some starting points to go look at um, maybe some some relevant material there. Um, but I think the most important thing is also if people identify gaps and they are in a position to start discussions and, and, and contribute to filling those gaps that it's uh, maybe also the onus is partly on, on, on us to kind of do that. There's a group community action as well as being led by institutions. Thank you. Uh, okay, we've got for about five more minutes left questions. Uh, Rob Ackrell asks, uh, he says, for two, uh, from his perspective, there are two challenges, changing the attitudes of university management and changing the attitudes of journal editors. And he thinks these two sets of attitudes are quite tightly defined. How to sort of lobby to, for change, how to convince those people in those senior positions to do things differently? Um, I think my answer here would be that I think we still need more research on research. Um, you know, and it's a bit ironic that um, when when looking at making changes within within the reward with, within academia in general, there's often uh, not always the evidence base, and I think there's actually a, a kind of um, a trap here as well that we start to change things without without kind of um, keeping an eye on what's happening and doing research towards what's happening and what are the consequences. In terms of uh, convincing 
convincing those stakeholders. I think these kind of discussions where we really talk about what the values are, are important. And I think it is creating space at institutions uh, to look at this. The journal editors is a particularly interesting one, not one I have immediately an answer on. I don't know whether people would, would be able in the Q&A or on Twitter to comment on that because it's not one I have an immediate answer to, but it's one I'll definitely think about. <laughs> yep. So anyone has any comments on how to get editors and de-publishers to change things, that'd be welcome. And I think yeah. from experience, having spoken to some of that research college friends, you can often get people from see quite senior people from organizations saying that, you know, they're, they in their sector feel kind of trapped like the system and the worries that everybody says that. So that suggests everyone's feeling powerless and that thinking it's someone else's responsibility to change. Yeah, and I think, again, there are already examples where um, where where senior leaders have gone against against that thinking and have tried to make change successfully. So maybe it's also being more vocal about those success stories and show that it is possible. Um, so I think I mean there's also there's a lot of research that I think isn't isn't really being put in the spotlight enough in terms of showing why it's important. I, I know, for example, Noemi Ober Bond did some research on looking at um, what researchers judge as important, irrelevant, or unimportant to both their career progression but also to advancing science. And there's really a discrepancy. Researchers realize, for example, that open access, uh, open open science in general and um, open, open data sharing are really important for advancing science, but they at the same time realize that it is not very important um, at the moment for advancing their career. Yeah. And in, in practice, that results in having more satisfaction from, um, from activities that progress their career. So, you know, I think we have to also just stand up a bit to ourselves as senior leaders as well and say, okay, if we believe that advancing science is part of our role, then we need to start taking these things seriously. Because at the moment, we are part of uh, not always incentivizing what is best for science. And we need to start to take responsibility for that. Thank you, that's very insightful. <clears throat> uh, two final questions, both on the topic of workload. One, Nicola says, what do you think, you know, the impact of workload of researchers and administrators seems to be key here, what are your thoughts? And Matthew Tata says, some Australian institutions are developing the idea of achievement relative to opportunity, where researchers' contributions are weighed against the time or opportunity available to them, i.e. Following career breaks, and wonder were you aware of that initiative, or if not, you know what you think of the initiative or the concept. So I'll I'll maybe first generally respond to the idea, the the kind of the concerns around workload. Um, and I think that the most important thing to say here is we cannot change just the CV templates and not change anything else. That is not going to work. That would result in definitely in unintended negative consequences. And we could see them coming. So that is not a good idea. Um, the idea of using these new templates would be that they should be contextualized in, in broader thinking around, um, around the careers of academics. So I think what the ideal would be of a lot of people who are working on these type of templates is that we would get a diversification in the types of careers that academics do. At the moment, they're all quite, quite similar. And I think that has to do with the, the narrowness of how we define success, um, actually. Um, so the idea would be that people could, um, that I, I think there's two options. One would be is that we, we, we kind of um, describe, have more, much more specific job descriptions. So this could be, for example, uh, a researcher who is hired to do maybe, I don't know, 30% research and is very much focused on public engagement and has skills very much in that uh, direction and is, is sitting within maybe a research group of, say, 15 people, but is, is kind of the public engagement person of that group, for example. So I think that would be one example where the job descriptions uh, are kind of attracting certain people with certain profiles who have focused more on certain elements. Or the alternative would be that uh, jobs are left more open, but um, academics can, for example, say, okay, for the next year, I commit to spending, I don't know, 30% of my time on teaching, 50% on research, and 20% and on um, policy engagement. Uh, and then after five years, their performance and their chances for promotion are judged against those percentages. So I think those are 
some just some conceptual options for how how we would want to change other parts of the system to make this work and ensure that that it doesn't mean that everyone suddenly needs to do everything because that cannot be um, that cannot be the objective here. Uh, in terms of um, this, I'm just kind of looking where the question achievement is. relative to opportunity. So a researcher's contribution is a way to get the time of opportunity available to them. I have to confess it's not a system I'm familiar with. So uh, just wonder if you're suddenly aware of it. So weighing up not just what people have done, but effectively the, the time and space they've had to, to achieve anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the concept. Um, although I'm kind of wondering whether it's still it's still within the context of we're counting, so we need to know where we should be counting less. Um, I would rather go to a model where we're counting less altogether, and yeah. because we're focusing on other elements, uh, maybe that kind of difference between people with career breaks or without will will be will be perceived differently if we talk about uh, if we if we if we have a conversation about um, all the contributions we've made more generally. So I think. I like the idea in the current context, but I think if we move to a context where we count less, maybe it's not necessary. Thank you. I think it's time for one final question before we let you go, especially them in a bit. Uh, anonymous attendee said they, they find the idea of the narrative CV or resume for researchers very attractive and see the advantages, but there could be an unintended consequence of potential negative effects on the quality, diversity, inclusion when required to craft a strong narrative. For example, if English isn't your first language or and some personalities may be more natural to oversell or undersell one's own contributions. So I wondered what your thoughts were on that. So the fairness aspect is the, it, it's quite, I mean, I come from a field where we do quality stuff on quantity all the time and objectivity can be quite challenging. So I wonder what your thoughts were. Um, I think that is that is definitely a consideration that should be made. Um, although I do think there are there are maybe in, in the in the CVs we use now and the ways we um, we uh, we we evaluate now, there are other biases. So I don't I don't think the biases of a narrative CV would be stronger than the biases in the current system. So that's one thing to say, but there are biases that we should be aware of. Um, I, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm wondering whether there's an opportunity to look at other sectors because in other sectors, the, the kind of narrative CV or, or at least the CV that leaves room for a lot more different contributions and um, a lot more kind of competency-based competency storytelling um, has been used for many years. So I'm, I'm imagining there will be solutions already in other sectors. So I think that is definitely, again, something to pull from other sectors potentially. Uh, but yes, an important consideration. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now, I appreciate you to go soon. You can't be around then. So Karen, on behalf of the world, I'd like to thank you for a fascinating presentation and a really rich and insightful Q&A session. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. It was very nice to be here. Bye. Bye.